Okay, you open your Bible with me, please, Jeremiah 29th chapter, please. Not a lesson on this particular subject, but what happened here was Jeremiah was told by the Lord that they were, Israel would be uh, in a 70-year captivity, and then God would bring them back uh, home. I'll just read starting in verse 10 with you through 14. He said, For, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years he will accomplish at Babylon, uh, I will, excuse me, I will visit you and perform my good uh, word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you and saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon the, on me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all uh, your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the, the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. My subject is reasons for unanswered prayer. Uh, I really uh, know that a lot of people uh, they they put a lot of emphasis on the fact that they they pray and God just gives them and takes care of things and yet at the same time they never go to church if they go it's once in a great while it's no real uh, dedication to the Lord and so I'm kind of wondering if God's the one's giving them something or the devil is because I do not believe my Heavenly Father gives people things when they, they're contrary to, the, to the following His Son. I mean, he, we may as well dismiss the church, quit having church, don't preach, don't do anything, just go on, go out there and live however way you want to and pray. God's going to take care of everything anyway. He's just going to give you whatever you ask, meet every need. And so why bother this? What I'm saying is there are a lot of reasons for real truly uh, prayers truly not being answered is rebellion. And, and it's not like uh, people are uh, outwardly looking like stubborn. They got a good attitude in a lot of ways, but they're just going to do their own thing the way they want to do it. I can't understand how you can get a prayer answered. I know one thing, when I tell my kids to do something and they don't do it, I don't give them what I was going to give them. I know that. That's the way I am. Uh, you, uh, I believe that they deserve, they will deserve what they get or they don't get it. Uh, stubbornness is one of the problems we have. I don't have to, that preacher is not my boss. I'm not trying to be anyone's boss. I'm trying to lead you to see that if you want the blessings of God on your life, then you listen to God. And you'll see how much he will, how much more. Just think if you uh, get some things, how much more would he open the windows of heaven on your life so that you could be just an abundant blessing to everybody around you? I mean, they could, it's, they could it'd be evident by what's going on in your life. They can help and say, man, that, that person is a Christian. And they see it by the way God just pours out the blessings to meet every need around you. Well, God made a promise to Israel. And one of the things he said was verse 13, when ye shall search for me with all your heart, not half-heartedly, totally wanting to find me. 
Paula used to tell me I, I may have a hundred pens, this kind of pen, writing pen, and I just misplaced one of them. And I would search till I found that one pen. She would laugh at me, say, you got 99 others. I said, no, I know, but I want my other one too. And I'd give all I had till I found that pen. I believe this is what, talk, what God's talking about in, in searching for me with all your heart. You're, you're not interested in everything else, just finding God in your life. Giving your total heart, knowing he's listening. Now, we're not talking about being saved, because let me tell you, there's a lot of saved people in the world that's missing a whole lot of things that could be theirs if they really would knock, seek, ask, and knock. They really seek. They really ask. I mean, genuinely, really ask God. Not, well, I don't believe God anyway, but I'll, in case, I'll just throw it out there. No, they really ask because they know that's where the blessings come from. And they believe him. And they don't quit. And they keep knocking. Uh, they don't just, I mean, they knock. They're getting God's attention. Really, the three things that he says shows whether you really care or not about whether you're going to get what you're asking for. Whether you really uh, have a devout, devoted attitude toward getting what you're wanting for mainly, and we'll see, for the glory of God, for your good, and for the benefit of others. You know, there there's some positive reasons for unanswered prayer as well as there's some negative reasons for unanswered prayers. And the Bible explains why they're not answered. Say, God hears everything. Yeah. God does. God hears you. But that doesn't mean he's going to answer you. He may let you just learn to ask in the right manner. You know, an unconcern about unanswered prayers reveals a lack of the life in the Christian. Number one, and this is, I believe, probably the number one reason for unanswered prayer, is priding self in personal righteousness. I go to church. I, I read my Bible every day. I pray three times a day. It's just a self-righteous attitude. That's, a, you know, those are good things. Going to church, reading the Bible, you know. But you have to remember one thing, one verse. Faith works by four-letter word, love. Faith works by love. I don't care how much faith you have. If it's not not moved by the love that you have for the Lord it's not for the right reason it's like what Paul said you can give your body to be burned if you don't do it for, for the love you wasted your time you just gave your body to be burned so priding self in personal righteousness is one of the main ones look at Luke 18 verse 11 through 14 I know you're probably, the older ones here anyway, you're familiar with this one because this is what, I, what you hear about. When you listen, if you just really listen to people, you'll hear this, one of these two people. Number one, uh, verse 11, rather, he said, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Did you get that? He prayed thus with himself. God... I thank thee that I am not as other men are. They're extortioners. They're unjust and adulterers. And even as this publican standing here by me, I, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
and the publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Wasn't anything self-righteous about this man. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. See, the self-righteous Pharisee came to the temple to pray, but he did not pray to God. He prayed to, with himself. I'm a great man. I do a lot of things. I don't ever miss church, and I do this, you know. My friend, that's the thing you should do, but it should be with the right attitude. It should be that it's because I just truly love the Lord, and I'm here for that reason only. Second reason is disobeying God's laws. Proverbs 28 and 9 said, He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Abomination means it's like a stench in the nostrils of God. That prayer is like a stink in something that just goes up into the nostrils of God that makes him want to regurgitate. And he said... Uh, he turned his, his ear from hearing, not just hearing, but really hearing it to do something about it. Hearing the law. He's not just, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments. You know, the law of God is, and for you and me, is this, the commandments that Christ gives, that God gives to us. And one of the main ones that's being neglected today in a, in a lot of churches is he says very clearly, as my pastor used to say, you'd have to go and take a course in ignorance not to understand this verse, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much more as you, you see the day approaching. You can't miss that. He, he's talking about when it's time for church, it's time to be in church. He's not talking about if you want to, it's because you have a love for him and an attitude that that's where he wants me to be. And if you hear what he's wanting you to do, then that's where you'll be. He tells us in another place, give and it shall be given to you, good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Pretty plain language. If there's a need, especially in the house of God, and you have the, the, the ability to help meet that need and you want, you just disobey God. That's a privilege you and I all have, is that God given it to us in order that when the time comes there's a need, we give back to him. It should never be that a member of this church should have to be living without their needs met, and they're trying. I know we all have... Uh, times whenever things don't go exactly right. I tell you, you have to really watch it today at the electric bills. They'll zap your pocketbook before you know it and say you're living on a shoestring as it is and that thing doubles in one month or more. That can hurt you. So what does the church do if one of their members has something happen? Let them get in the cold, let them turn their electricity or their water or what? No. We find they have a need. That's a deacon's responsibility of a church. The deacon's responsibility is not to run this church. That's been misconstrued in the minds of a lot of people in churches. The deacon's responsibility is to see that everyone that has a real need has that need met. They bring it to the attention to the church so the church can help to meet that need. And so disobey God. There's a lot of things that you can do and disobey. I, you know to do, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. You see, that's, why, that's, that's a disobedience, and, a, and as I said, one of the reasons for unanswered prayer. I remember one time, <clears throat> Randy's just about 16, and I'd already told Paula if he did this certain thing, I was going to give him $40. And I asked him to do it, and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Guess who got to spend the forty dollars? He never didn't know I was going to even give it to him, and he never did get it. 
and that's the way I am about my grandsons. There's a lot of things they miss out on because of their stubbornness. You see, God does that with us. We have privileges coming to us that he wants to give, and he even tells us what they are, and then we stubbornly rebel against him and say, okay, <laughs> you, you silly kid, you're not going to get anything. You're just barely going to eat a, a bologna sandwich this way. <laughs> I'd love to have a bologna sandwich right now. <laughs> no, a lot of things that God wants to do, he just can't do it because we disobey. We're stubborn. Regarding iniquity in the heart. The word regard means to kind of hold it dearly. You know, you really like this sin. Iniquity is stepping over the boundary line. God has drawn a boundary line, and you go over it. You, hey, you went against God. You went over it. But then it, it wasn't all that bad, you think. So you kind of hold to that. And you keep it in your heart. And the time comes, you've already made up your mind. I'm going to do it again. Well, listen to what David, King David said. Psalm 66, 18. I, there's a lot of things that you're to regard. Just, you may just have a real love for them. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. See, God hates sin with an infinite hatred. On the other hand, he loves righteousness. When sin gets between us and God, that will rule out our prayers from being answered. It's not, as Isaiah said in the 59th chapter, I don't forgot the verses, 1 and 2, or 7 and 8, I don't know. Anyway, it's right there. It's not that his hand's too short that he can't reach down and answer. It's not that his ear is dumb, a deaf, I mean, he, he can hear. But our sins have come between us and him. And he, he can't. He won't. He won't answer. That'd be contrary to his very teachings. <coughs> Regarding in iniquity in the heart to stop you from receiving what God wants you to have. Offering unworthy service to the Lord. Malachi says, right, chapter 1, verse 7, I like Malachi. Malachi is just a short book, but it's got a lot of information for us. He said to the Jews, he said, You offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. I'll bring whatever I got that's not even fit for me to have, and I'll give it to the Lord. And that's what I used to tell people, I aggravate them, though. I'd say, if you got toys at your house that ain't fit for your kids to play with, don't bring them junky things down to the church. You want the church to have toys, go buy some new ones and give it to the church. See, people unload their closet and give it to the Lord. They don't need it anymore and don't want it anymore. I believe the Lord deserves the best of everything. He should get the top, uh, the, the cream off of the milk. He should get the very best of it all. And then we get what's left. You know what happens if you do that? You'll wound up with more money or whatever it takes to get whatever you gave to the church or to the Lord for yourself. It's like planting corn. You bring the best grain, put it in the ground, but guess what? You get a whole ear, usually two or three. So you give God first. We're not talking about tithes. You should do that too. I'm talking about if you have an idea up here, hey, you know what? I, I feel like they need this over there. I'm going to go buy it. <laughs> You'll find out how God can bless. Give God be the best. Asking amiss. <clears throat> James 4.3. <clears throat> he said, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your, your lust. In other words, the only reason I'm asking God for anything just for me, I'm only, I need a new, I don't need a new car, I want a new car, and I'm asking God for a car so I can go to Colorado and Florida and, 
and wherever else and do all this just to fulfill my flesh's desires. You're not going to get a new car like that. But I guarantee you one thing, if there's a need for a new car to get, your, to get things done for the glory of God and for your good in doing it, he can do that, and he will do that. We ask amiss. A lot of times. I'm just as guilty of that as anybody in the world by doing that in my past, you know. It's uh, asking amiss is another positive reason for unanswered prayer. God wisely considers our petitions when they're not for his glory or our good. He will not give it to us. You know, sometimes you... Uh, a kid will want something real bad. They'll scream for it. But you're wise enough to know if they get it, it's going to hurt them. I was talking to someone this week. Uh, they said uh, they bought a jar of uh, candy-coated uh, vitamin C. And their children found that, and it's so good, they ate half of that whole bottle. Three little kids. I said, oh, whoa. Thank God our body don't retain vitamin C. <laughs> But you know, that's not good for you. There's some things that's just not good. And so God holds them back. Praying with a selfish motive. Same verse, he said, ye ask and receive not, because he asked to miss that ye may consume it upon your lust. It's a selfish reason for, for asking. And God said, no, I don't give it to you. And last is wavering at God's promise. Look at James 4. I'm sorry, 1, verse 6 and 7. Wavering. He said, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, verse 6. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. You know, uh, here we go. Go to God. This is a, this is wavering. We'll go tell God our problem or ask for whatever it is that we're wanting, and then we're going to resolve the problem. We're, he's not moving fast enough. And so we're going to figure it out on our own. And that's wavering. That's not full trust. You know, God said to me to ask him. And I'm going to wait. He directs me to do something. Okay, I will. But it's just like, a, I, 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 oh, I can do this. I don't, oh, yeah, God, I just asked you, but I can. Uh, you know what God does? He backs off. And he lets you run your head into a brick wall until you finally figure it out. I can't do it. I, I, God, I've got to just trust the Lord to do it. And, you know, I've heard a man one time when I was pastoring in Beaumont, we, I mean, not Beaumont, uh, in Gaysville, and we was trying to raise money for the church, and uh, he said, uh, and I said, you know, the Lord blesses us and gives us our means and whatever. He said, he ain't never given me no paycheck. I've earned every dollar I ever worked, ever got. I didn't answer it. I didn't say a word because the Bible says answer not a fool in his folly. I'm going to tell you, you don't have anything he didn't give you. You may not deserve some things he even allows you to have. But if you work for it, he must give you some good health. He must have allowed you to find a decent job where you can make it. It's not yours, it's his. And he's blessing you with it. So... <coughs> A lot of times we try to figure it out on our own. We're back and forth and back and forth. We run to God again, then we figure it out on our own. It didn't work, so we run to God again. We try to figure it out again, etc. Finally, we give up and say, you know what, God? I'm a dumb Christian. <laughs> I'm leaving it with you. I'm through. you got to direct me into whatever it is for me if I need to do something in order to get it, but I'm trusting you. I never have had a doubt since I've got it settled in my salvation. I mean, I believe God.
but there's some times whenever I've tried to figure things out on my own, and I found out every time it didn't work. Just had to back up, turn it loose. This old saying, let go and let God. You know, he's able to supply all the wisdom we need to live our life. We need to ask for it. He said, if you lack wisdom, if any man lack wisdom, that's talking about how to live your life. Let him ask of God. And he gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. So you fail 5,000 times before you don't know, bring that up. Now it's when it counts. And he's going to answer your prayer. <coughs> Do you ever hastily try to answer your own prayer? You know, you go to God and you turn around and try to figure it all out wavering, not really trusting God. God's not going to do it. I'm going to do it on my own. You ever been down that road? Sometimes maybe man's a little too pious even to let God even work in their life. You know what the, the Pharisee, he said, they that exalt themselves shall be abased. They that humble themselves shall be exalted. God will lift you and God will take care of but you and I need to let let God do it, you know. We need to obey him with what we know to do. We don't always know everything, but we need studies to show ourselves approved to God. You know, if you're a new driver and you don't know the speed limit on this street out here, and you come rip, ripping down through here at 40 mile an hour and that policeman stops you, you tell him, you know, I didn't know that speed limit. He said, you're ignorant of the law, but this is still the law, and you're going to pay for it. There's a girl, I was talking to a guy, his daughter. She come down that street highway from Comanche down to <coughs> Dublin and doing 80 mile an hour. The policeman stopped her, and he let her go. Two days later, she came down that same highway doing 80 mile an hour, and the same policeman stopped her. He said, now, you knew what the speed limit was. I'm the one that stopped you the day before yesterday. He wrote her a big ticket. <laughs> he, was, he was nice the first time. They don't have to be. What I'm saying is, you say, well, I don't know what God wants out of me. Study. Studies show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't know, there's someone around that will be able to help you, guide you. God's got them in, uh, available to you. These Sunday school lessons are lessons that will tell you what you're to believe and, and really good, you know. And these other lessons that you're going to work through, the beginning part of them may seem shallow to some of the older Christians, but as they go along, they're just going to develop you more, and you're going to be stronger. And no wind of doctrine can come along and sidetrack you. I know what I believe. I believe it because God said it, and I'm settled. A stamp would be dismissed.